and let's pray. Father, thank you for even just the words of that song reminding us that this world is not our home, that you are our great reward, and that we, above all things, long to see Jesus Christ glorified, getting all that is due his name. Father, help us to live well these days, the difficult days we live in. Help us to live well in the midst of prosperity and blessing. Lord, even though you may take everything away, help us to live well for you, blessing your name, being thankful to you that we are your children. Nothing we have in this world and nothing we have in this world that is taken away could compare to the riches we have in you. You have blessed us with everything that is good and right and yours. You've withheld nothing back, not even your own son. You freely gave him up for us. You'll freely give us anything we need to live well for you now. May your word that we look at even here this morning work to that end, that we might live a life that is pleasing to you and we might do it well so that you are glorified and our light shines in a dark world. And we ask it in Christ's name, amen. Well, let's take our Bibles this morning. Let's open them up to Romans chapter 6. Thank you so much for letting me inch my way through this chapter. I had no intention originally to do this many sermons. I can tell you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I was going to do seven through all this, and I think we've already done 17 or something. I don't know. Romans chapter six will be in verses 17, 18, and 19 this morning. The church throughout the age uh, goes through different seasons of struggle and upheaval. And there's two that I want to draw attention to this morning, and both of them really have connection to a faulty view of the grace of God. They're kind of opposites, but they're both um, similarly tied to a, a wrong view of the grace of God. Sometimes the church finds itself being um, screamed at by what I'll call never lawers, not lawyers, never law People who would say, never law. Law has absolutely no place anywhere in the Christian life. Law to them is so anti-gospel. It is only ever opposed to the saving grace of God. It's antinomianism. And of course, there's grains of truth at points in this kind of thinking, Since salvation, they would say, is by grace alone through faith alone, quite apart from the works of the law, these never lawers have determined that law or obedience to commands has very little to no place at all in the lives of the ones who are saved by grace through faith alone. And the evangelical church today is probably in that season of upheaval and has been for a while. The struggle in the church comes from an incomplete understanding of the role and the power of grace and sanctification. And Romans 6 reveals how Paul faced the other upheaval, the other season that can overcome the church. That season is the one in which never gracers scream at the church. That grace will only encourage believers to continue on in sin and be slothful in their fight against sin here and there in their lives. And the reason they come to that faulty conclusion is, in their minds, since since grace demands nothing but faith, and since grace rejects any works of law at salvation, it therefore appears to be very unconcerned with sin. In fact, Paul even says, somehow, grace benefits from the presence of sin. You know, where sin increased, uh, grace abounded all the more. So why not just keep on sinning? And this struggle in the church comes from a false and slanderous view of the role and power of grace in sanctification. And obviously, the solution to both of those spiritually stormy seasons for the church 
is to know what the Bible says. It's to know what the Bible says, specifically about grace. To correct both of those dangerous errors, and they both are dangerous. And what we get to witness again this morning in the last half of Romans 6 is just exactly how Paul taught in order to overcome the never gracers slanderous accusations against grace. He said in verse 14, you shall, um, sin shall not be master over you because you are not under law but under grace. You're not under the power of law. You're under the power of grace. So you're not, sin won't master you. But that brought a protest, a slanderous charge. Well, then you're only going to sin, verse 15, because you're not under the power of law and instead under grace. See, they don't think very highly of grace. Let me read verses 14 and 19 for you. For sin shall not be a master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now... Present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Do you remember the gospel's second defense of grace? We've worded it this way. It begins in verse 15, and it runs to the end of the chapter. But the gospel is defending grace for the second time now. And here's the defense. Grace in no way is rivaled by the power of law in the fight against sin in the believer's life. Some believe that law as a power is the only way to fight against sin and that grace as a power is actually weak against sin. And so grace in no way is rivaled by law in the fight against sin in the believer's life. And therefore, since grace isn't rivaled by law, here are some things we know. Grace is unrivaled power against sin, and the believer does many things. Let's just briefly review the first three that we've covered. First, grace's unrivaled power contrasts and clarifies the only two slave categories possible. Verse 16, grace begins with these shocking words, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. It's right in the middle of verse 16. And this is simply the truth about the human race. And grace makes it very clear that there are only two slave options for us to consider. Either, verse 16, I am a slave of sin, and that results in or that expresses my spiritual death before God, or grace has been powerful in my life, and instead I am a slave of obedience to God resulting in or expressing righteousness or righteous practices. And Paul's whole point is that grace is the powerful means that gets you all the way from the one slavery to sin to the other slavery to obedience to God. And the point is, law as a power will never get you from slavery to sin to slavery to obedience to God. Secondly, grace's unrivaled power against sin in the believer's life creates thankfulness to God for my new slavery. Verse 17, Paul has something of a thanksgiving outburst as he considers what grace has achieved, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart. See, when we're saved by grace through faith alone and we are under the the reign and the power of that grace in sanctification, we're not able to constrain or restrain our thankfulness to God because we are truly in a much, much better slave condition than ever before. What a joy this slavery is in Christ. And grace is the only power that can turn the believer away from himself toward God with thanksgiving. It is a God-centered thankfulness, but thanks be to, to God. 
if law as a power was given to us and we used that and somehow attained righteousness in practice, well, then we would only be able to thank ourselves for what we achieved. Thirdly, grace's unrivaled power against sin in the believer delivered me over, delivered me over to a teaching pattern or a teaching mold that becomes a standard that we must conform to and delivered me over with heart-generated obedience. That's verse 17, the last part. You became obedient from the heart to that form, to that pattern of teaching, a teaching standard to which you were committed or to which you were delivered over to. If the goal or the destination in your sanctification and in mine is what is said in verse 16, that we need to be, reach obedience uh, resulting in righteousness, then God's grace and power must get you there, unquestionably so. It's not an option for grace to fail in getting us there. How can I, uh, in obedience to God, express righteousness, righteous thinking, righteous communication? How, what are the right attitudes to display, the, the right desires to act on, and the right deeds and actions to do? How will I even know which ones are the righteous ones? Well, the answer in verse 17 is you were delivered over decisively so. You were handed over to a teaching pattern, a teaching standard that will help you attain the righteous living. There should be no doubts about whether you should trust the power of grace in your life to get you to God's sanctification destination, God has a teaching form, a, a teaching mold or a standard that you must be conformed to. You must match it. And the reigning power of grace decisively handed you over to that standard of teaching. And the reigning power of grace then also not only does that but the reigning power of grace transforms you at the heart level such that with deep, heart-joined, heart-generated obedience, you obey that standard of teaching. And it ensures you will express righteous thinking, righteous words, righteous attitudes, righteous desires and deeds, and go about your relationships in a righteous manner. So how precious the word of God is to the believer who's being sanctified. And how trustworthy it is. It's, it's the status, it's the standard that we were delivered over to like a slave to a master. It's, it's, it's our master. God's plan is that he would, by his grace, deliver you over to it in such a way that it can speak over your life like a master and guide you into everything that is righteous in his sight. Is the word of God precious to you? If so, what does that look like during the week when you're not here and it's just you and your Bible? Next, fourthly, this is new. Grace is unrivaled power against sin in the believer. Number four, abruptly displaced my old slavery with my new slavery. Verses 17 and 18, we'll take these two together this morning. Romans 6, 18 is actually an extension of verse 17, describing in vivid terms what was elaborated on in verse 17. Look at verse 18. And, in connection with verse 17, having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Freed from what? Well, slavery to sin. Freed to become what? Slave of righteousness. So now let's put these two verses together. But, but first, a little clarification on the word became in both. Or if you have the ESV, I think it's have become. And that occurs in both verse 17 and verse 18. In verse 17, you became obedient from the heart. In verse 18, you became slaves of righteousness. I think that word became could lead you to some false conclusions about how your one slavery ended and your next one began. Let me tell you what it's not like. It's not this. Though you were a tadpole, you became a frog. Though you were a caterpillar, you became a butterfly. 
One's for the guys, one's for the girls, okay? <laughs> those becomings in each of those, they are transformational processes, right? A becoming that takes place over what? For time. And what grace has done as a power to get you from your one slavery to the new slavery was nothing like that. This is no bullfrogs and butterflies becoming. I think it would be better to translate in verse 17. Look in the middle there. Though you were being slaves of sin, the emphasis there is on the continual pattern. Though you were being slaves of sin, watch this, you obeyed from the heart. It's like, what? What? That's a whiplash moment. You were being slaves of sin. You obeyed from the heart. Where did that come from? And better to translate in verse 18, having been freed from sin, you are enslaved to righteousness, or you were enslaved to righteousness. There's no transformational season going on between the two. There's no cocoon development going on. There's no weaning off process that's taking its time. There's no space between these two slaveries. It is not a spiritual evolutionary process that occurs between the two slaveries. The only thing that is between the two slaveries is the power of grace in the gospel. That's it. There was your slave to sin status, and then the invading, rescuing power of grace came, and then your new slave status began. This is the displacement of the old slavery with a new one. It was not a gradual displacement of the old with the eventual arrival at some point down the line of a new slavery. It was an instantaneous, complete, and therefore abrupt displacement. And Paul's main point here is to defend grace before the one who thinks that the power of law as a force is the only way to combat sin here and then there in your life. You see, the problem is the power of law as a force has no power, no power at all to instantly and abruptly end your slavery to sin and then immediately establish you in a new slave status. All law as a power can do in your life, according to Romans 5 verse 20, is strengthen your bondage to sin. So if that's all it can do, it has no power as a force to fight sin here and then there in your life. Only grace as a power can achieve that status change and be powerful then to fight this sin here and that sin there in your life. That slave status change, that's the foundation which enables you to fight against sin here and there in your life. You must be this new slave to fight sin. You can't be the old slave to sin and fight against sin. You won't. You can't. Instead, you must be immediately and powerfully given a new slavery to righteousness status if you are going to fight by grace against sin here and then there in your life. And so this morning, you, you are one or the other of these two slaves. Remember, there, there's no space between the two classes of slavery, between the two statuses. So there is no one this morning in an independent status between the two. There's no one here this morning in a transformational phase. There's nobody here morphing from one slave slowly but surely into the slave status of the other. There's no one here who is the missing link between the two. You are either a slave of sin, slaving away in that sin, or you are a slave of righteousness, delivered over decisively to the Bible, slaving now toward righteous living. Can you identify which one you are? Which one best describes you this morning? And again, the only difference between the two 
is grace. Not intellect, not wisdom, not class, not wealth, not skin color. Grace makes us new. Fifthly, grace's unrivaled power against sin in the believer speaks clearly to me. Speaks clearly to me to make my new slavery understandable. Verse 19, I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. What does Paul mean by this statement? Well, speaking in human terms, that means speaking just after the manner of men. The way that Paul has been speaking about slavery to righteousness is something a little strange. Um, Men don't engage in discussion about slavery in a positive way. It's not a befitting subject to talk about. It's even repugnant. And Paul has taken this amazing, exalted achievement by the grace of God in our lives, and he's plunged it down into a human phenomenon on the earth that polite people don't like to talk about. His way of speaking about slavery to righteousness is is not something he regrets necessarily, but he knows it has a, a shocking effect to hear it this way as it makes its point. So there's something of a mild apology going on here. Why has he done this? Verse 19, because of the weakness of your flesh or the natural limitations, the ESV says. Because of their current condition of fleshly weakness, the Roman believers, um, that, that is what moved Paul to speak of our status displacement in these human terms. Sometimes Paul used this kind of phrasing, um, fleshly weakness. Um, sometimes he used this Uh, phrasing to impugn his audience. If you want, you can write down 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3, and you can see how he used that kind of phrasing to rebuke the Corinthian believers. But here, he simply uses this kind of wording to, to just highlight the weakness of their human condition before God to grasp this exalted reality. This exalted achievement of grace can, can be too easily missed by us because of our inherent fleshly weakness. Paul is saying something like, I'm speaking in kind of low ways about a subject, slavery, that isn't spoken of in positive terms. I do it so that this ex- exalted achievement of grace might actually overcome your inherent weakness. In other words, we have to understand this. We have to understand this. This has to be clear. Too much is at stake in your Christian living. Too much is at stake in your sanctification. So this tells you that one of the things that Paul feared in their Christian living is is them not understanding what grace had achieved in them and what the power of grace had achieved for them. Not knowing this or or being fuzzy about the abrupt displacement of our old slavery with our new slavery is actually detrimental to your spiritual condition. Whatever way Paul could get this truth across to them, he, he used. And so this is why, as believers, we we, we must never have the attitude that, oh, we don't have to sweat the details on what God says about our holiness. What about you? What's your attitude towards the pursuit of holiness, the pursuit of sanctification, the process of becoming increasingly holy? Do you find yourself content to not dig into 
the details of God's word on how a Christian is supposed to live his or her life? Have you ever asked yourself, why? why? Why do I have that attitude? What's going on that would make me want to think that way? Rather, a believer, listen, don't rest until you get what is fuzzy cleared up. Don't throw up your hands because you have weakness of the flesh, and that makes understanding important doctrine like this an uphill climb. Seek answers in God's word. Open your Bible and pray. Plead for help to understand because this must be understood. And we're told here that God, through Paul, accommodated his language so it would be clear. We're just weak. You often hear people say something like this or ask this kind of question. Why is the Bible so hard to understand? It's actually the wrong question. The better question to ask is, why am I so slow and weak to grasp the truth that is clear? The fault doesn't lie on the side of Scripture. The weakness is on our side. God has spoken clearly. In fact, he'll even, through Paul, take steps and speak in such a way that it's kind of shocking to get our attention so that we can grasp this important reality. Lastly, this morning, Grace's unrivaled power against sin in the believer commands me to arrive at holiness as surely as I used to arrive at lawlessness. Number six, Grace's unrivaled power commands me to arrive at holiness as surely as I used to arrive at lawlessness. Verse 19, the last half. Notice how this last half of verse 19 is structured. Do you see it there? For just as dot, 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 so now. What does that indicate? That indicates that there are two things that are similar. Just as one thing, so now the next thing. And it sounds like it's something from the past on the one side, and now there's something now, a current reality for the believer. Well, what was the past thing or reality? It was you presenting your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness. And what is the now reality that has some kind of similarity with that? It's now presenting your members as slaves of righteousness, resulting in sanctification or resulting in holiness. Now, how on earth is there any similarity between those two things? One slavery is going as hard as it can to the east, and the other slavery is going as hard as it can to the west. But therein is the similarity that exists between the new slavery that it has with the opposite old slavery. What is it? The similarity between the two is that both slaveries reach their destinations without a doubt. That's the point being made. Slavery to impurity and slavery to lawlessness undoubtedly arrived at further lawlessness. And slavery to righteousness undoubtedly arrives at holiness. So grace, based on my new slave status that it achieved for me by its power, commands me now to arrive at holiness. As surely as I used to arrive at further lawlessness. That's the point. Now let's look at the details of it because it's shocking. Notice in verse 17, our old slave habits. Notice it says members there, just as you presented your members. We've seen that word before. Look back up at verse 13. Do not go on presenting the members of your body. Oh, those are the members of my physical body. And so Paul says that again. These are the portions of me. These, these are the pieces of you, the members of our person 
And, and notice what we did. We presented our members, our portions, as slaves. Believer, be, before the power of grace displaced your former slavery, this is how you thought of your members, your portions. This is how you viewed your members as slaves. That's what they were. They were nothing more than slaves themselves. And you, being the slave of sin, you voluntarily, you willingly presented your portions, you presented your members as slaves, you offered them to another master. And the first master in verse 17 is, you I'm sorry, verse 19 is, you presented your members as slaves to impurity. Impurity is personified as if it were a master or a lord. And you used to present your members as slaves to impurity so that they could slave away under impurity. The word impurity means spiritual uncleanness, spiritual defilement, spiritual corruption in the sight of a very pure and clean God. What we once did without Christ and what we did without the power of grace is this. We approached impurity, so to speak, and said, Master impurity, I have portions of me that I think of as slaves. And I offer them to your defiled lordship so that you can fulfill your corrupt will with them. Let them serve your filthy purposes. And there's another master, lawlessness. Verse 19, you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness. And lawlessness is personified as if it's a master or a lord. Lawlessness is contempt for the lawmaker. It's shaking a defiant fist in the face of the lawmaker who is God. It's rebellion against the laws of the lawmaker. And what we once did without Christ and without the power of grace was similar. We would approach master lawlessness and say, Master, I have portions of me I think of as slaves and I offer them to your rebellious lordship so that they can help you express your contempt for the lawmaker. Let them serve your defiant purposes. That's what we did. And where does that kind of living end up? Resulting, verse 19, in further lawlessness, further contempt for God and his laws, further contempt for his rule, more defiant fist shaking in the face of God, more rebellion. That's where it ends up. And so there we once were, filthy, defiled, unclean, corrupt slaves shaking two fists in the face of God, the lawmaker. Now, let's bring some specificity to this. I want to take you back again to Romans 3, verse 10, because I think this is exactly what Paul was pointing at, thinking of. Look at Romans 3, verse 10. This is a vivid and tragic picture of what this looked like for us, and this is what it looks like for you if you have not yet been saved by Jesus Christ, if the power of grace in your life has not fundamentally changed you, such that you are arriving at two, a, a completely different destination, this is where you are still at. Believer, this is where we were. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous. Well, of course not. If we're doing that with our members, presenting them to impurity and lawlessness, nobody's going to be righteous. Not even one. There is none who understands there is none who seeks for God. Of course not. We're shaking a fist in his face. All have turned aside. Together, they have become useless. There is no one who does good. How can anybody do good if we are presenting our members to impurity and lawlessness and it just ends up in further lawlessness? How, how do you do good in that condition? There's not even one. And you notice what Paul does here. He, he doesn't just say this about the individual, but he says, we're all in this together. Together, we're in trouble. This is that solidarity with Adam that he talked about in Romans 5. 
And if God is going to save you, it's not just about saving little old you. He must extract you out of that, out of those people, out of that solidarity and lawlessness and impurity. And that is what the power of grace does when it saves a sinner. And now he talks about our members. Verse 13, their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Listen, that's Romans 6, 19. Uh, you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness. My, my throat and my tongue and my lips and my mouth, they were all slaves that I handed over to deadly communication, deceptive communication, poisonous communication, and cursing and bitterness. That's what we did with our members that helped us communicate. My feet, I saw them as a slave and I handed them over to murderous things in relationship and destruction and misery in the lives of others. That's the way I took. And my eyes, they were a slave I handed over to, to gaze upon anything and everything but the fear of God. How impure a life is that? How lawless a life is that? Being slaves like that with slave eyes, slave throats, mouths, lips, and tongues, and slave feet, how could we not reach the destination of lawlessness? It was a sure arrival. There was no other place we could wind up than that. There was no way we ever fell short of that target but we hit that target hard and decisively. Let's go back to Romans 6, 19, and let's see the similarity. Right after that in verse 19, so now, so just as that, so now we surely, without a doubt, must reach a new slavery destination. Now, the two destinations could not be more polar opposite from each other, right? Further lawlessness and sanctification or holiness. And again, the only way that this new destination of holiness can be decisively reached at all is in your new slavery. You can't do this in your old slavery. A new slavery must come by the power of grace that displaced completely and entirely and abruptly the old slavery. And then by grace, believer, you must obey the command in verse 19, which says, so now, present. It's an imperative. Present. Beloved, listen. Grace commands us. We're not antinomian. Grace commands us. And you can see why it can and how it can with all that is achieved in our lives. Grace has a power that you are now under, it commands you to present your members. And notice how you see your members. They're new slaves. Present your members as slaves. So your feet get presented to a, a new master because you view them as a slave. Your, your, your eyes get presented to a new master all of your members that help you contribute to communicate all get presented to a new master. Who is the new master? Verse 19, now present your members as slaves to righteousness. Righteousness gets personified as a master. And the context indicates this is righteous practice, righteous doings. It's not God's 
declared righteousness, and not, not God's declared unchanging righteous status that we gain by faith alone, in Christ alone, that was unfolded for us in chapters 3, 4, and 5. This righteousness here would be akin to right attitudes, right thinking, right words, right actions, right ways of going about relationships. And now by the power of grace over you, it is as if you can now say, Master Righteousness, I have portions of me that I think of as slaves, new slaves. And in obedience to grace, I present them to you that they might serve your righteous goals for me. Let them serve your righteous practices. And where does that kind of living end up? Resulting in sanctification or holiness. There the obedient believer stands with with righteous ways of seeing the world and seeing God, with righteous ways of communicating, righteous ways of relating to others, undoubtedly expressing holiness of life. And the point Paul is making is that grace as a power no less enables us to reach our new holiness destination than our former slavery to impurity and lawlessness helped us to attain further lawlessness. Grace is not less effective in our new slavery. It is not less effective toward making sure that we attain holiness There's one thing that Paul is making clear here and the gospel is making clear here. There's no way for us to walk away from Romans chapter six thinking that grace, you know, it's probably, it'll fail you. I mean, it's there sometimes, it's really dependable, but there are times you're, it's gonna fall short for you. There's nothing of that here at all. We can't walk away from this passage thinking grace is insufficient as a power for sanctification. We can't walk away from this passage thinking grace is weak regarding its ability to get the believer to holiness. It achieved, think what it achieved for us. It achieved a new slave status for us that cannot be undone. And from that new slave status, we can, through obedience, We can reach that holiness destination. Think what grace has done. Grace has also in that delivered us over to the teaching of God. That becomes our our mold standard pattern and we get conformed to it. And we have the sure power of grace to get us there in that new slavery No one can read Romans 6 and walk away thinking low thoughts of the power of grace of God in the gospel. Believer, never doubt the power of grace, what it is to be under grace. There should be no doubt in your mind about how sure it is. Doubts everywhere in me. But never confuse your inability at times to hit the destination. Never confuse that that grace failed you. Because it does not say that. It's on us. And this is why we come back to the gospel over and over and over again. Like Peter, we set our minds on man's interests, we deny the Lord, and we must come back to his great work at the cross that forgives us. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the devil is mocked again because God doesn't throw you away, but he picks you up And you press on again with the power of his grace. If you do not know Jesus Christ, if you're hearing this from 
God's word and, and you know that that does not describe you. In fact, what describes you is that slave to sin. I just plead with you to come to Christ today, even now. Humble yourself before him and confess what you are to him. He knows what you are. He knew what we were. There's nobody here who was so smart who kind of figured it out and got a shortcut and got the angle on, on salvation. No, we didn't. We were running hard towards lawlessness. We were there, further lawlessness. That's the only kind of human there is that the grace of God can save, and he saves sinners through his son who went to the cross and he bore every guilt and shame that your sin could present before a holy and clean and pure God. Cry out to him by faith. Say, I trust you you and what you did at the cross on my behalf. Do that Romans 6 thing to me. I have no interest in trying to transform myself over time to that because I realize I can't. Look away from yourself and cast yourself on the grace of God. He saves sinners and he gives you a grace that will never fail you. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for your word that is clear. Thank you for making the efforts that you did so that it could be understandable to us in our weakness. Thank you that it is clear in this, on this important subject of how we should live our lives in Christ. Lord, we rejoice that your grace is as powerful as it is. You have spoken of it here in Romans chapter 6 in such ultimate and decisive terms that it's almost shocking to us. But of course, how could your grace ever fail your purposes you sent it for? The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness. It does what you sent it for in our lives. Lord, may we rejoice to be under the power of the reign of grace in our lives. And Lord, if there is any residual thought or attitude within that likes the power of law, to advance us, Lord, I pray that you would let us see it for the sham that it is. And we, and we can do that, Lord, without any hesitation because grace commands us to reach the destination of holiness. It has the power to do that. Oh, Father, will you draw near to us in our weakness this week and help us to run a little better, a little stronger, a little further toward holiness. Forgive us, Lord, where we have sinned against you and failed to rely on grace. And forgive us for how easily deceived we were by our sin and temptation. And thank you for your precious son who absorbed every square inch of your wrath to give against our sin. We rest in him, how good he is, how loving he is towards us, how safe we are in him. And it's in his great name we pray, amen.